Is it there we go, we're recording. All right. And I'm gonna go screen share. And I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm gonna bring it up here. And I'm gonna go to present. So all this stuff is the stuff that Matt's gonna help cut Edit out. out. And everything looks good. You guys can see the screen and everything? Yeah? Yep. Yep. We're good. All <clears throat> right. And here we are. I'm Lori Bithrella. I'm uh, from New York. I'm here with Beth Bolger, who's also from New York. And I'm also here with Tom Gucci. And we um, had offered to bring a session to the EPEW virtual conference. Our session is called Breathe. And that's what we're going to do as we go through this. Um, we have a QR code right here on this front slide. The QR code can take you right to the folder with all of our handouts. Um, it will include this Google slide. So if you are looking for information, the QR code will also uh, be presented again at the end slide. But right now, I'm going to click forward. And I'm just going to start with a quick introduction about myself. I am Lori Bifarella. I'm from Attica, New York. I teach at Attica Elementary. I have had 32 years experience. I'm just starting my 33rd year. And one of my favorite quotes I love to share is from Maya Angelou. Her quote is, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that is something I like to take with me every day. And I just like to share how I feel and make other people feel. I want good feelings all around. So I'm gonna hand the baton over to Beth Bolger. Hi, I'm Beth Bolger. I teach at Lincoln Avenue Elementary School. It's in Sable, New York. It's a K-5 building. I've been teaching for about 19 years and I believe wholeheartedly that social emotional learning and physical education need to be taught hand in hand. We need to embrace the whole child's approach to teaching and learning. And now I'm going to introduce you to Tom McCucci. Uh, Tom McCucci, go ahead. How you doing? I'm Tom McCucci. I'm from Bedford Road School in Pleasantville, New York, in Westchester County. I uh, just finished my 25th year teaching phys ed there. And I believe that and using physical education is the tool to just build well-rounded, balanced individuals and giving them the tools they need to be fit not only in their mind, their body, their soul, and all their thoughts throughout their lives. So hopefully with this presentation today, you'll be able to see how you can share some of these tools with your students in the physical education world as we move forward. Why are we calling it BREATHE? Well, it BREATHE is an acronym and we felt it was very appropriate for this one. It stands for Building Blocks to Promote Relationships that empower all students and give them tips and tools to help them navigate along their social emotional path. Focusing on the student's well being before the content that we're gonna be teaching. And looking ahead, obviously moving into this post pandemic world that we're gonna be entering now in our physical education classes and also throughout school, we wanna help our children navigate through that and know that in their minds, um, they're gonna be feeling all different types of emotions from stress, anxiety, anger, fear, not knowing what's coming. And we're gonna hopefully give you some of the tools through this presentation to help those children navigate through that and, and let them uh, get through those struggles to be able to be much more positive and productive uh, throughout their days and throughout their lives. So I believe we're gonna begin. So we're going to take you into a little virtual classroom that we created for this presentation. And we're going to start with this QR code that's on the, the front slide right down here. And if you have an iPhone, you can simply open up your camera and you can focus it on the QR code. I don't even have to snap the picture. Um, there's a website at the top that opens up and we created a Google form that we have a little breathe self-assessment that focuses on the zones of regulation. Um, if you don't have an iPhone and you have an Android, I wish I spoke Android, I don't speak Android that much, but I think there is an app you can get from your Google Play Store that has a QR code reader 
you can go back through these slides and you can access the, uh, the Google form that way, but you can also access it on the slide because we created a link to it. So if I click on the QR code, it brings me right over to the self-assessment. And this is an example of um, a, a core part of our presentation, the zones of regulations. So the zones of regulation, we have a cute little video here that explains it a little bit deeper if you wanted more information. This form is geared to you as a professional. So it'd be your name, what level do you teach at, and um, are you currently required to incorporate remote learning in the 2020-2021 school year? When you go to the next uh, field here, part of the self-assessment, we're asking you to go through this as a professional. Now, our students, what it looks like, it looks different, and we're gonna be talking about that in our presentation, but just we wanted to give you a feel for what this would look like if you wanted to do a self-assessment. So the question is, what best describes your current mood regarding their teaching requirements placed upon you by your district in the 2020-2021 school year? I'm gonna go with yellow. I am a little bit anxious. Um, I'm a little bit nervous um, as to the direction our school district is going to be going in. And I'm gonna hit next. And the Google form is gonna walk me through some uh, different techniques that can help me with my frustrations, my anxiety. Obviously, this the techniques are geared towards our elementary students, but we just wanted you to have a lot of resources. So by going through this Google form, it's additional resources. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. It's just another little research resource. I'm going to bring you back to our presentation. We're going to pop back into the gym. And I want to hand the baton over to Beth, and she's going to talk to you a little more about the zones of regulation. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, the zones of regulation are a fabulous tool designed to foster self-regulation and emotional control in our students. The zones teach our kids self-regulation by categorizing all the different emotions we feel and states of alertness we experience. And they categorize them into four colored zones. There's a red zone, yellow, green, and blue. And the zones are presented to the students in a form of a traffic light, which is a fantastic visual for our students. The red light, just like red light is on a traffic sign, would mean stop. Um, when one is in a red zone, it often, which is often the case, we have to stop and breathe and take a second. The yellow sign means to be aware or take caution with your emotions. Uh, when given a green light or in a green zone, one is good to go. The blue zone can be compared to the rest sign or, or a stop or like a rest area where one goes to stop, to rest and re-energize. So each zone provides strategies to teach students to become more aware of and independent in controlling their emotions and impulses. It also takes kids, it also makes kids aware of and teach them how to manage their sensory needs, which is really important for the kids to know. So Lori, if you wouldn't mind going back up to the traffic sign one, and right there on the right-hand side, if you take a look at that picture, uh, these are the posters that I hang inside my gym. I hang them on both sides of the gym so when the kids walk in, they can tap either side um, as they enter. So when they enter, they tap the color zone that they're in or they're experiencing the motions of currently. Next, they're gonna take a moment to practice the technique listed on the poster. This allows them time to inwardly reflect on their emotions and gives them time to practice these techniques. I teach a technique from each zone prior to introducing the zones of regulation. This way, when I introduce the zones, it's not overwhelming for the students since we have already practiced them and they feel comfortable with them. And as I introduce the new techniques through the year, they then get added to the posters. This way, they're kind of building a toolbox of techniques for their life, not just for now, but for later. And these posters are super valuable for me as a teacher. It gives me an opportunity to check in with each of my students. I team teach, so I have two classes. So you're looking about 50 to 60 kids. So it can be difficult if I sat there and asked and spoke to each child, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? What's going on in your life? This gives me a quick read. Within 30 seconds, I can evaluate how, what students are in need. Who's feeling a little tired, who's a little restless? I have to pump up the energy a little bit or who's feeling some kind of emotional instability? Who, do, who needs my time? Who needs my attention the most? 
and I need to prioritize that and, and check in with them. And it gives me an opportunity really to see who's in need and to assist them with those social emotional uh, needs. Um, and also, I not only do this in the beginning of class, I also do it at the end when they're leaving my class, they have to tap out, I call it. And this allows me to eyeball any new issues that arise. I can check in and see maybe that student who came in on red, maybe now they're leaving my class at yellow or green, and that's great. Or maybe the student who came in green is now tapping out at red. That gives me a second to say, hey, Johnny, hang back for a second, come talk to me. Hey, I noticed when you came in, you were green and now you're red. Uh, what's going on? Did, did something happen? How are you feeling? Are you feeling frustrated? And it gives you a chance to really connect with the child one-on-one -on -one and assess what they need and provide it for them. And it gives them that language that they need to communicate those emotions and how to label them, which I think is a wonderful tool that I wish I had when I was younger. Um, Lori, you can keep going forward. Um, right there, stop for a second. You can go to the red zone. So the red zone, uh, back up one side. There you go, right there. So the red zone is used to describe extremely heightened states of alertness and intense emotions. So students who are coming in at the red zone are usually experience anger, rage, aggression, or possibly horrible fear or terror when they're in this zone. So it's really important we give them those strategies, which we'll talk about in a second. If you can go to the next slide, which is our yellow zone, this is a more slow caution area. And when the students are in this zone, um, some words, uh, they're usually in a heightened sense of uh, heightened state of alertness and elevated emotions. Um, sometimes they feel high excitement, stress, frustration, maybe they're embarrassed, having some anxiety, confusion, maybe they're acting silly or have their wiggles or nervousness. So these are all different things that you might feel in the yellow zone. If you can move on to the next one, which is the green zone. Green zone is usually calm, a sense of alertness. It's usually where we would love our students to be to learn. Um, they're described as happy, positive, focused, calm, content, um, and eager. So, and then the blue zone is a step below green. And this is your, what I call the rest area. Uh, blue zone is usually a lower state of alertness and energy. Uh, really, usually you have with this state, emotions such as boredom, sadness, maybe the student is tired, maybe they had a long night, maybe they're not feeling good, maybe they're under the weather. So these are all reasons that they would be described in our blue zone. So now, Lori, if you can go to the breathing techniques, and right there, that's perfect. So breathing techniques in those four zones, what I do is I always start off with just one technique for each of these. So the red zone, the kids know, and Tom, I'm gonna to pass you the mic in, uh, in one second. So the red zone, if they were feeling this way, they could do the balloon breath. So Tom, would you mind leading us through that? Yep, so like Beth said, you know, they would be feeling angry and really heightened in this state. So what we wanna do is try to just get them back, calming down and just breathing a little bit and being aware of where they are, what's going on to try to calm them down. So as you'll see here with the balloon breath, basically it's for them to imagine their stomach being a balloon. And what they're gonna wanna do is they're gonna wanna inflate that balloon using their breath. And by doing that with nice slow intakes of air through their nose, their stomach will inflate. And then what they'll be able to do is hold that for several seconds, blow it back out again. And we find if, um, Laura, you wanna hit that video, as you'll see, will find as they're doing it, doing it for about four or five times, they'll be able to calm themselves down and be able to, uh, to regain some composure, hopefully to get back into the gym. And it's basically just breathing in through the nose, imagining a balloon in your stomach, getting that balloon way, way out there, holding your back nice and straight, and then breathing out again. And like you said, just being in the moment and having those children um, just be aware a little bit of that calming sensation. So that's what we would be using in that red zone called the balloon breath. Thanks, Tom, that's a great visual. So the next one for the green zone could be a flying bird breath. And a flying bird breath is great for calm, for focusing and to getting centered. So Laura, if we wouldn't mind 
playing a little bit of the video. Flying bird breath is all about getting strength. We're inhaling strength on our breath. So when we take a deep breath, our arms start at our side in mountain pose. We take a deep breath in. And as we open up our arms, or our wings, we teach the kids, we're a bird, we're flying. Arms up on the inhale, exhale, arms down. And we're exhaling stress, anxiety, and we're always inhaling our strength, our freedom, our independence. So inhale, deep breath in, using our wings to fly, exhale. We come out, we release all the negative energy, and we focus only on the positive. So next, if you were feeling in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is for the yellow zone. So the flying bird breath is for yellow zone. For our green zone, which is like eager to learn, uh, keep going. Oh, I'm sorry, half sun sal uh, salute. Half sun salute is great for the green zone. So even though it's a red card, that's just the way Yoga for Classroom uh, categorizes their cards. This is perfect for the green zone. And the reason is when you're in the green, you usually have energy. So we want to keep it going. So, and Lloyd, would you mind playing a video a little bit on this one? And I'll kind of talk you through it. So usually in this, you start in a standing mountain pose. And so you would take a deep breath in, exhale out. And on the exhale, you would fold over like you see me in the video. Your arms are out to the side by the outside part of your toes. Your back is straight, your spine is in line. And on the inhale, you're gonna slowly come up first to your knees because it's a half sun salute. You would come to your knees first with a flat back. You would exhale back down to your toes. And then on a second inhale is when you would stand up, take that deep breath and bring your hands back down to, to heart center. Okay, so it's a deep breath in, fold over down to your toes, half, pull, half fold up, exhale out, inhale all the way up, exhale back down to heart center. And this is perfect for your green zone. So the next is the bunny breath, which is awesome for energizing. This is when you're feeling tired and you're sick. Lori, take it away. Uh, first of all, Beth, I have to tell you, I get in such a zone just listening to you talk about your breathing techniques, you know, getting <laughs> centered. And I'm getting centered for my bunny breathing technique. So like Beth said, this is a blue zone. And this is where we want to give a breathing technique that refreshes, energizes. So the bunny breath technique is a little bit different. Um, we are going to start in a mountain pose, but you can be standing mountain or seated. We'll play a little uh, video demonstration. And in this technique, you are going to take three to five really quick breaths, inhaling through your nose. And as you exhale through your mouth, you want to have a very subtle <sighs> as you exhale. You're going to repeat this four to five times. And this whole sequence refreshes and energizes. And you want to fill your lungs with positive energy and get yourself centered and focused and ready for the day. So that is our breathing technique of the bunny breathing. And Beth, you had mentioned these uh, yoga for classroom cards. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are pretty cool. They are fantastic. I, I got certified in yoga for the classroom uh, last year and I was able to bring it uh, to my district and they're fantastic. But you don't have to be certified to get the cards. I definitely suggest the cards. They are, if you see that they're different colors, so there's red, blue, yellow, purple, green. Each of those colors, it does not represent the zones of regulation. That's something different. But you can use these tools um, with the zones of regulation. But the color coordination on the yoga for cards um, are all like the, the blue cards are breathing techniques. The red cards are standing active poses. Um, there's also imagination vacations, which is more scripting of meditations. So they're really, I can't say enough, Yoga for Classroom is a fabulous tool reach out to them, there's a QR code. Okay, so now before we move on completely to the mindful moments, I just wanna say uh, it's very important to tell our students that all the zones are normal and natural and we all experience each and every one of those zones. There's not one zone we're meant to be in. We all, possibly throughout the day, multiple times, we can experience each of those zones back and forth, day after day, every minute. So what we want to do is do stress to our students that our zone is determined by how we are feeling inside and it's not our outward behavior. Sometimes the way we express ourselves outwardly is not necessarily the way we feel inside. 
So that's important to explain, explain to the kids. That's how we feel on the inside. We want to pay attention to that, be aware of it, and be mindful of it. And also don't suggest or portray one zone as being worse than another. A lot of times I find when people talk about the red zone, they speak about it in a negative light, but being angry or, uh, or um, hurt or stressed out is not a negative emotion. It's a natural emotion. So we wanna teach our students that all these emotions are totally normal and natural and that it's okay to be there, okay? So now we're gonna talk about our mindful moment. So mindful moments, uh, back up. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, I'm there. That's okay. I'm going to talk. This is our first time it. doing a virtual presentation. So <laughs> <laughs> we got this. We got this. Yeah. Well, in my district, um, we have to take attendance every day in every class, regardless if the teacher does it in the beginning of the school day, it doesn't matter. We have to. So I hate wasted time. I, 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 it drives me crazy. So if I have to do that, then I'm going to make it purposeful. So what I do is I have the kids during their attendance, they go to their squad spots, but they're not stopping, they're not um, sitting there, they are taking a mindful moment. And I do it a couple different ways. Uh, some days I'll do it on, these are like those giant posters with the lines on there, uh, I guess about three by two, two by threes. And I'll write different suggestions that I have. I usually put about five out and let the kids pick. Um, some days I even project it to the, the side of the wall of the gym, so it's really nice and big. And what it is, it's just a moment where for one minute, the kids can pick one to two mindful activities and practice them in the floor spot while I'm taking attendance. I play some calming music. I have these little tea light candles I'll put out and they're always there in the corner and I just flick the on switch on, give them a little ambiance. And we take a moment to be present, to be grateful and to give ourselves that necessary love, which we all need. So some of those, my favorites are, um, Give yourself a squeeze, wrap your arms around yourself, hold it for 30 seconds and say something wonderful about yourself or uh, stop. And in fact, let's all take a moment. Let's stop and let's think of three things that we are grateful for. So I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. Stop for a second and think of three things you're grateful for. And just be present in that moment and that feeling that you feel when you're thinking about those three things. Awesome. And do you feel how calm and how positive you feel? Well, think about the gift we're giving our students when we give them this, all right? So Lori, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. And uh, the next one is we're gonna talk about imagination vacations. So imagination, imagination vacation is also one of the cards for the yoga, uh, yoga for classroom. And really simple, in my district, we wanted to make SEL and mindfulness a district-wide push. We were doing it in my elementary school, but we wanted to do it for the whole district because I think it's important that we're all on the same page and not just in our school, but our community as well. So our videos started to go out to, commu to the community. So we shared that so we can you know, get it from the parents and everyone's on the same page. So this imagination vacation, um, every Monday, the district at 915, all the teachers would stop what they're doing and they would play a video that we, myself and a couple other um, teachers on our team created. And they only are two to three minutes. Um, it's hard to get teachers on board in the beginning when you're doing mindfulness, but when you explain to them the value of it and it only takes a minute to two minutes to do something like that, they start to, to get on board. And all this is, is, is a script. I use Screencastify, you can even, play it on your computer, the YouTube, and talk over it. And it's a script of imagining you're in this location. So Lori, if you wouldn't mind playing it for a second. And all it is is a beach. It's got the sounds there. I'm encouraging the kids to listen to the sounds that they hear, to pay attention to our senses. What do we see? What do we hear? What do we smell? And just being aware and present in that moment. So it's a really relaxing video for the kids. And when the kids finish with this, they all, you can see they all were calm and they were all eager to learn and, and come back and focus and present. So again, it's a, it's a great gift that we can give to our students and also classroom teachers because they're excited and eager to learn back on track again. So that's an example of imagination vacation. Again, that's in your yoga for classroom cards. 
And now I'm going to pass it off to Lori. She's going to teach us all about wellness. And it's one of my favorite, favorite things that she does. So yeah, wellness, this is really interesting. Um, this kind of came out pretty strong during our quarantine and the packets we had to put together for our school district because we are a paper pack, paper pack, packet district. Um, we don't have a lot of Wi-Fi and connectivity in our area. We're in a very rural area. I'm actually in my office today doing this because we have better Wi-Fi at the school than I do at home. But I want to talk about um, how this quarantine led me back to really emphasizing the importance of sharing the wellness components as part of our educational material. Just a real quick refresher for all of you, because we are all professionals. We know the components of wellness. We have physical wellness, refers to your well-being, your physical body. I have examples of physical wellness down below, and I've done this for all the components. So we have emotional wellness, which is living life, a full and creative lifestyle. And I love this, the top one says, remind yourself to stay positive always and smile. I feel like that's my mantra. Uh, we have social wellness, which is uh, building relationships and connections. And I felt like this was a really huge uh, component to focus on during quarantine. I really don't like that they keep using the word social distancing. I think it was Kate Cox that first used the word physical distancing. That's how we should look at this because socially we need to stay connected and keep our physical distance. Uh, then we have our cognitive wellness, being open to new ideas and experiences. Um, we have our spiritual wellness, and I know this one's tricky because some people get caught up on religious beliefs. And we need to like open to spiritual wellness as living in accordance with morals and ethics and values. And that would be the focus of the spiritual wellness um, in our, as we portray it and share it with our students. Um, the paper packets, I wanna go back to that real quick. This was our phase two. We went into our weekly wellness check was what we called it. We sent this home to the families. This is something that I found on Twitter um, it was shared by a few teachers from Australia, and we changed it to fit our district needs because we know what our students have um, mostly, for the most part, at home, and we wanted to give them a focus on wellness um, as their home during the quarantine. So what does this look like at home? So we asked the students to choose one activity box from three different columns every day. So the columns all have the wellness components, components, and the activity boxes vary, and you had choices to make. So for an example, this student, we could say, chose these three uh, wellness components. They wanted physical, emotional, and cognitive, and they created a uh, self-created Tabata that includes four skills they created that we covered in class. Um, the emotional wellness was turning off your device for at least five hours between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And the cognitive wellness was uh, <laughs> completing a mindful moment, moment and sitting quiet with your thoughts. No distractions for five minutes. Love that one. Um, then I started thinking ahead. So continuing with the wellness check, something that they were introduced to, to at home and how can we bring it into a school setting? So starting to create the rows with things that relate to their school world. What is, what is around them at school? So three columns a day. So let's say this student, student chose physical wellness. They opt, opted to use a standing desk in the classroom. Social wellness, they participated in group discussions and practiced active listening. And spiritual wellness, they volunteered to help another classroom teacher before or after school this another step further what if we incorporated this wellness check into a lesson so i want to continue with my content area skills that i have um, in my lessons but i also want to include the wellness component so what this could look like is we could choose one component of wellness to add into the lesson so for our example we're going to choose social wellness and the students can come into the lesson and we're gonna give them two goal choices and ask them to work towards achieving 
one of them within their time with us during the lesson. So one of the choices could be giving a compliment to a classmate as they're working on a skill. And complimenting someone really, it benefits both. You know, you, you have someone who's struggling and they're trying to knock over a target. We're working on rolling and they are not giving up. And another student recognizes that. And in that little moment, they say, I love how you keep trying. You're almost there. Keep it up. You know, the world just changes. Or they could choose to start a conversation with a new friend. You know, we get new students in and out of our district a lot. So, you know, open up that conversation and simple conversation. Do you have any pets? And let's, let's talk about our pets. And what's your favorite thing to have for lunch? I'm going to tell you flat out. It's a grilled cheese sandwich and tomato soup, hands down. <laughs> oh, I love it, it's so simple. But, you know, make a new friend, focus on wellness, and let's, let's keep the wellness going as we move forward in our 2020-2021 school year. I'm gonna exit the room and I'm passing the baton to our friend Tom, who's gonna talk about a coping toolkit. Perfect, thanks so much, Lori. So now we're gonna, talk a little bit about how uh, some of the tools we're going to have for the students to use um, to cope. And what we call it is our coping toolbox. And a toolbox is just a bunch of different items that you're going to use for different situations. Obviously, um, you know, thinking of a physical toolbox that you would use in your home, well, this is going to be coping toolbox we're going to have in the gym. So it's just a place to keep things that's going to calm the children down things that they've gathered, it's gonna be, some things are gonna be tangible and we're gonna put, show you a little bit about what that means in a minute. And then other things then will be intangible objects that will go into this um, virtual toolbox that we'll have. So it's a self-regulation is the ability to monitor and manage your energy states, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in ways that are acceptable and produce positive results. And that's basically what we wanna do. Some of the children, like we talked about, when they come into those hot zones, they're coming into us in red um, or even the yellow, we want them to come in and, and have positive results so they can um, produce and, um, and be mindful in our classrooms. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is some tangible examples of items that are personal, that are individualized just to that one student. And you see on the screen things like a personal stuffed animal of some sort. Um, a picture of a family member or a special person in their life that gets them to be calm or gets them to get them to smile again and be happy if they're not happy or get them to be calm if they're angry. A great tool is to have them come up with their own little cards, things that what would calm them down if they were scared or if they're worried or, you know, if they need some more attention or if they're anxious what personally would they want to think about and have them put them on cards, laminate them, put them on rings. And then when they're going over to this toolbox, they'll just flip through them and they'll bring them back to that um, state of calmness, hopefully. We have things like bubble wrap. Um, everyone loves bubble wrap and gets them out of their, their angry zone that they're in and gets them back into um, a positive state. A windmill, blowing it, seeing it blow around, awesome. Obviously, a uh, um, stress ball that we've all probably used at some point are all just great personal tools that these children can have in their own personal toolbox, and they'll be able to handle them going forward on and off. Next, we have is a, uh, some examples here that we have for you, and you can look at through these um, at, at your leisure later. Some of these items, like we have proprioceptive support, which you may not have in the gym, but the children may come to you into the gym from their separate classrooms. So things that you should be aware of, like cushion or weighted stuffed animals, or pressure vests, or sometimes they have the um, wiggly balls, things like chewing gum that kids are coming into, um, different scarves, uh, fabric. Um, sometimes they're gonna have some sort of smelling materials that that uh, approved by the school coming in from uh, from the classroom to your gym so you could look at these and also some of the other items that you'd be able to uh, have in your gym here these are a little bit for the elementary kids if we move forward you'll see there's another example for some of the older kids they could draw their own um, puzzles they can have some sound machines a lot of them may have headphones 
you know, cards they can read, they'd be able to read different stories, any of these um, tools that would help the children to get um, back into those positive green zones to get them moving again. So as we move forward, the next slide here, these are things that we're looking possibly when we do get back in the gym that you could have in some area that will be able to be sanitized and uh, other children can use them. I know Beth mentioned before, those flickering lights, those are awesome. Where the children would be able to flip them on and just watch flicker to calm them down. Playing cards, where they would just be able to flip the cards maybe and just see the different visuals or think about different ideas as they're going through that. Um, the snow globe is a great example of showing the children when you shake it up and everything is in chaos, if you just take a minute to relax, everything calms down again and they can get back into focus. And there's some other examples here also that um, are tools that, like we said, be able to wipe them down after a child did use them. So as we're moving forward back into the gym after the pandemic here, we'll um, be able to have the children um, use them over and over again. Hourglass, let them flip it over, let them just watch that sand go down and have them realize when that sand goes all the way through, it's time for me to get back into the activity in a positive way. So those are some great examples. The might next just be, that might just be a minute class, right? Maybe a minute worth of sand instead oh, I'm of an sorry. hour. Oh, sorry, did I say hour? <laughs> well, it, yeah. just, it is an hour glass, but. <laughs> <laughs> an hour would be a little long in our, in our gyms now. <laughs> right. Are we going to the and next then, slide? As we move forward, okay. you'll see we have, um, this would be a place where they could go for some intangibles now. And what we've uh, talked about is creating a place and possibly putting up a picture of a surfboard, a surfboard where you'd be able to talk about, come over to this area, and then you wanna catch the next wave to get back into your activity that the rest of the class is doing. And these would be some mindfulness and tangible tools we talked about before, relaxation, those breathing um, techniques that we showed you before, was some place here where they'd be able to do that, to just calm down, to relax on their own, maybe put out a yoga mat, let them do some quiet stretches on their own so that they could catch that next big wave, get them back into the gym, back into those activities with the rest of the class and be able to go. And doing this on their own, they um, won't be individualized out, but be able to, um, to calm themselves on their own. And, and it could um, be as simple as just putting tape on the ground. Like you, you don't need the yoga mats. You don't need the surfboard. You can use those exactly. as references. It, it's, it's just a space where there's no questions asked and they have access to it to help them self-regulate and, and like, like you say, catch the next wave in, join us when you're ready to come back. Right. Those are exactly. Great. Cool. All right. Where are we going? Oh, I know where we're going. We are heading over to the Peace Path. Beth Bolger, can you take us down the Peace Path? Peace Path. Absolutely. Um, Peace Path, uh, I, it's such a fabulous tool. I can't even express it. I love it so much. Um, I saw there was a need in my, in, for all kids, not just my district, but for all. And I'm guilty of it as a parent too. I tend to try to solve my own children's conflict, which instead of empowering them to find a way to uh, solve it on their own. So noticing that the kids uh, were not given time to practice conflict resolution, especially specifically in elementary school. Um, it's such an important skill and in order to be good at anything, we have to give kids time to practice it. So as adults and parents, we tend to work the problems out for the kids. Why? Because it's probably quicker, it's easier, and sometimes we forget that uh, it is more important to stop, take time, teach the kids how to do that, and let them do it on their own. So this is the Peace Path is six steps and it's tools to teach them how to be confident in working out conflict completely on their own. It's a great visual aid um, to help kids or students guide them through it step by step. And also I find I'm a visual learner. So everything I do, I have visual tools to it. Why? It's how I learned and I think um, it's helpful to try to teach to as many senses uh, for our students to get them to retain information. So, for example, um, this example of the Peace Path is actually in my house, and it is taped next to my phone, and 
I have two boys and a little girl and my middle child and my younger daughter argue a lot. So rather than me try to play referee in between their arguments, I wanted to give them the tools as well, not just my students, but also my own children. So I hang this in my house. So I took a picture of it um, now. And what I do is I take clothespins and I put it on the, on the piece press so they can move it from one step to another. But for my students at school, uh, Lori, if you wouldn't mind going to the next uh, picture, don't play it yet. Hold on one second. It's actually a physical path. It's like a six step um, and it's a ladder I put on the floor so they can actually physically walk the path together. So Lori, if you wouldn't mind playing it for a second, uh, you can go, you can play the video. Yep. And I'll kind of talk over it and through it. So the peace path, this is a video I made from my district to kind of explain it to them and to show it to the students because anytime they see students, um, on video, they're engaged, they like to see that. So this is two kids uh, acting out a situation where one student felt like the other two were talking about her, which is very common in elementary school. Uh, they were giggling, I saw them giggling and looking at me, they were talking about me. So this is an example of what we, uh, what we did with our students and we had them physically walk through the path. So right now Lily's saying to her, let's walk the peace path together. So they come up to the path and these paths we have all of my school. I have one at every corner of my gym. All the lunch monitors have them. It's in one in each classroom. So that any point the teacher can say, rather than interrupt learning, here's a peace path, go work it out. Because now the kids know how to use it. And the teachers are very receptive too because they're like, oh, it takes away less time from the classroom. So thank you so much. So. This is what it looks like. These two students' first step is to agree to go on a peace path. Let's face it, there are times when you just had an argument with a friend, you are in a heightened state, and you are not ready to deal with anything. You want a chance to be separate from the problem, and just, you're not ready. So when a student, and that's okay to tell a student, sometimes you're not ready at that moment, maybe you have to come, come to it tomorrow. So Lloyd, just hit pause for one second. So step one would be to agree for the students to engage or to come to the path together. If I go up to Lori and we had an argument, I said, Lori, will you get on the peace path? It is okay for Lori to say, you know what, Beth, this problem just happened and I'm not ready. I need a moment to just uh, breathe and be away from you. Is it okay if we postpone this? No problem. So when the two people are in agreement, that's when they take the first step together, which is, we're gonna get on this path and we're gonna see if we can work it out. Not that we're gonna to come to a conclusion, but we're gonna see if we can work it out together. So step two would be to stop. Okay, now we're both agreeing to get on this path together. Let's get in the right frame of mind. We're gonna stop, we're gonna take a deep breath and you can play the video from this point forward and we're gonna relax. So you see the kids stopping, taking a deep breath in and relaxing. And that just gives us that moment to pause and not let those negative words blurt right out of our mouth. We just take that mindful pause and refocus. So now we come to the third step. And the third step is where each of the students talk about how they're feeling. So they're using I messages. So each student will take a turn. I'm feeling this way when this happened. And on it, you see these little pictures or emojis of emotions so that the younger kids, if they don't have the word to express it, they can point to a picture and say, I'm feeling this way. And I felt this way when you did this. And we're teaching kids to use iMessages to be accountable for the way that they're feeling, to, to express the way they're important, that it's important to express that. And they're taking turns. So one student will say first, the other one has to be quiet and listen, and then the other person goes. The fourth step is, repeating what you heard. So this is really important to make sure that your point got across. They, they heard exactly the way that you're feeling. So they're taking turns saying, I heard you, I hear you say, you feel this way when this occurred. And it gives that other student an opportunity to say, no, you only got part of it. I'm also feeling this way too. And it gives them a chance to see that the other person really did truly hear them and that their, their, their emotions matter, that their feelings matter, okay? So once they both take turns repeating what the other student said, then they would move on to step five. 
step five is where all the brainstorming happens. This is where they, the real conflict resolution comes in. So now that they heard what both people say and feel, they're trying to find a win-win solution. And sometimes those win-win solutions, and we have to teach our kids, aren't always 50-50. It could be 80-20. It's whatever works out the best for both students involved. And very important, it's okay to teach a kid that sometimes saying, I'm sorry, is not good enough. Sometimes an I'm sorry doesn't, doesn't justify. We don't have to settle for an I'm, so, I'm sorry. So sometimes more action is needed, okay? So once they come up with that 50-50, they have to agree on it, which is step six. Okay, I think I like this brainstorm idea. Do you like it? Yes, I like it. So step six is, do we agree with the solution and we act it out or do we disagree? It's okay to say, no, I don't, know, I don't agree with that. I think we can come up with the best, that, that solution isn't good for me. It's not gonna make me feel better. So if that occurs, then you say, okay, let's go back on the path and try to find a new solution. So sometimes it's not just one way. Sometimes it's repeated. And in all our arguments in our life, well, sometimes we have to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying until we find the right solution. These are all things that, that kids are gonna have to deal with in life. So it's important that we teach them that it's not always just a one way fits all, sometimes we have to practice. So as you can see, uh, Laurie, would you mind going to the next page? So when we taught the students this peace path, I have a peer leader program and they work out conflict with the kids and they go outside and recess and they run games with the kids. And I train them first and I use them as peer leaders. And I made groups of four and one peer leader for each group or myself or the guidance counselors also came in to assist me. So we had small groups and we would teach these kids these steps and let them go through it. So Lloyd, would you mind going to the next uh, slide, which is our conflict cards. So if you take a look, there's K through two scenario one, and there's also a scenario two. Um, there's two scenarios, for both K through twos and three through fives. And if you see it, it says student A. Student A, you are upset because student B had a play date and you were not invited. Student B, you're going to pretend this. You had the play date, but your friends only let you pick one friend. You chose Sally and not student A. And then you say, okay, now work it out through the peace path as if you're student A and as if you're student B. It gives them a, an opportunity to role play and to really go through the steps and practice. And that's super important. If we don't give them the time to practice, they'll never get good at these skills. Okay. And Lloyd, would you mind going to the next slide. So this is just uh, an overview of the day where we trained the whole staff, uh, the whole school and the staff and the lunch monitors also attended this um, presentation we did so that they could also be on page because we gave all the lunch monitors the peace path as well. So that way if a conflict resolved we would tell the lunch monitors don't resolve it for them. If you can try to stay out as far as you can but give them the peace path and see if they can work it out on their own. And a lot of times they can. You give them the tools and, and you're, it's amazing what they can do, okay? So I think at this point, we're going back to Lori to talk yep. about the virtual classroom. Right, so the virtual cl classroom is something that popped up all over social media um, during the quarantine. And it's, you know, it's a really great online resource for your remote learning because you can teach a lesson and links it to videos and resources that you wanted to include in your lesson. And uh, Beth, Tom, and I thought it would be a nice little platform to use to uh, share our presentation. So I click up here on our slide seven, and we actually have a video here that we made with Screencastify on how to make a virtual classroom or how to create it. And um, I'm not going to play it for you now. It's something in our resources where if you wanted to use a virtual classroom as part of your lessons moving forward, it's just another resource, another tool for you. So I'm going to pop out of this slide and go back to the gym. And I believe the last slide we're going to is the end here um, is slide number eight. This is a um, resource site slide for you that has all of our email addresses. It has our Twitter handles. The QR code that you see is a direct link to the, the folder with all of the handouts. Everything that uh, Tom and Beth and I presented will be um, in the handouts. 
So you're going to have access to everything, including the slide. Um, there's links to the resources for the yoga for classroom. Um, there's links to the videos. So you are going to walk away with a lot of great stuff. We uh, are truly honored uh, to be included in the EPEW 2020 virtual conference. So thank you again for inviting us. And um, we look forward, hopefully, to attending in real person 2021. That would be super fun, wouldn't it? Yes, um, very much. So um, I guess we're going to just kind of like breathe a little bit because we're done. Take a deep breath. And um, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Tom. It was an honor working with you. This is fantastic. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was great. And, and if you have comments or questions, you could type it in the question box and we'll answer it for you guys. That's right. I forgot to mention, <clears throat> we will be live with you during the virtual playing of this. So if you want to ask questions during that time, just type it in and we'll, we'll reply right away, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. We're Fantastic. here. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop uh, the recording. <laughs> Thank you for watching this session from EPEW 2020. We're saving the next few minutes for you to ask those final questions before we log off. If you have any questions afterwards, please reach out to the presenter or send a message to EPEW through our website. Don't forget that we have more amazing sessions going on. Head over to our website, epew-cp.weebly.com and look for the virtual EPEW 2020 tab. You can also access the presentations on YouTube by typing in the hashtag EPEW2020. We'd like to thank the amazing EPEW committee for all their hard work over this past year. This event would not have been possible without their dedication, commitment, and volunteering their time to providing high quality professional development. Don't forget about our other events like our socials and share times. Links can be found on our website. Remember our motto for EPEW, come to learn, leave as family. Thank you for joining our family today.